There we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this evening's Silicon Valley Engineering Council Engineers Banquet. So we're going to get started. First, I would like to recognize the Board of Directors, the Silicon Valley Engineering Council. First, first, with our, whoa. First, President Liana Ye, Member Delegate for the Association of Computing Machinery, San Francisco Bay Area Professional Chapter. Vice President Shri Saleen, Member Delegate for the Electric Auto Association of Silicon Valley. Secretary Elise Inglehart, Member Delegate for American Society of Mechanical Engineering, Santa Clara Valley. <laughs> Treasurer, there we go. Treasurer, Dr. Seal Craig, Member Delegate, Society of Women Engineers, Santa Clara Valley. Director, D Jack Jew, Society of the, for the Advancement of Ma Material and Process Engineering, Northern California Chapter. <laughs> Director, Dr. Dr. Janneke Schneider, Member Delegate, Society of Plastic Engineers, <laughs> SPE Golden Gate Section. And Director Glenn Friedman, Member Delegate for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. <laughs> Santa Clara Valley section. So without further ado, I would like to welcome up for a few remarks, President Liana Ye. Hello, uh, I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, I think this event put together is looks so great to me and I have not been such a, a meetings before. So this is my first time. If I make some mistakes, just raise your hand, let me know, okay? <laughs> uh, and every event of, to take a team of people to make it happen. We want to uh, thank the whole team, and here is a list. Uh, Todd Mosher, Jack Jew, Kevin Caraman, Jerry Polovsky. Hey, good. You dress very well today. Glenn Freeman, Bill Burns, where? Elise Engelhart. Alvin Chen, Martin Stein, and Yannicka Schneider, Michael Wright, and uh, Rajiv Gupta. Who is that? I never met you before. Oh, thank you. Uh, Sri Salen, I know where you are. Jeff Norris, where's the Jeff Norris? I never met you before either. Uh, <laughs> Pashan at sea. Seal Craig. Ed Elke. The silent again? I saw him last night. Okay. Um, and also student volunteers, who they are today. Do they anybody? Oh, they are still behind, I guess. <clears throat> I would also uh, recognize our guest here, uh, Tom Coughlin. And that's IEEE, uh, what do you call it, president? president? Yes, you finally got into president, okay. <laughs> and, uh, Armin, Paul Havens, yeah, and 
he, he is, uh, I would say he is also a volunteer for us because he has been helping us quite a bit lately. And I think there are some other attorneys uh, that I didn't recognize today. So I skip that. Now, <laughs> among the, all these helpers, I want to thank Dr. C.O. Craig, and who is heading the banquet committees and put so many volunteers together and contributed. And let us give her a round of applause. And thank you so much for your contributions to SVEC since September 2022. <clears throat> I want to take this moment to introduce my fellow ACM Bay Area chapter members. And please stand up to greet the colleagues and the guests. San Francisco Bay Area, did anybody there? Did anybody from San Francisco Bay Area ACM group? Oh yeah, good, raise your hand. At least I can see you. <laughs> and I want to take the moment to introduce them. And uh, San Francisco Bay ACM has been a professional chapter since 1957. But this event is the first time ACM has standed and and attended this uh, Silicon Valley Engineer Council Hall of Fame inductee celebration. Uh, you see our chapter name, San Francisco Bay. I hope they are ordering salmon meal today in celebration of Bay Area seafood. San Francisco Bay ACM will be streaming this celebration onto YouTube so that people can interact online with the Hall of Fame the inductees and the keynote speakers. And briefly, at the end of each speech, you may, help, you may type your questions into the chat to participate. We have a Tom Moran and a Carl Anderson online to transfer your questions to our speakers. Now I'll hand it back to, your, to our MD. You know when I turn my microphone on. Okay, so thank you so much, Liana and ACM for webcasting. So now it's time to eat. Please continue to enjoy your food, enjoy your company. For those of you who are interested, the bar is still open and there's wine provided on your tables. Just letting everybody know first, we have started the live stream. And I, we have started the live stream, folks, and we would like to get going with tonight's program. So feel free to keep eating, but first, I would like to express sincere thanks and appreciation to our sponsors. Without their support, this event would not be possible. First, let's recognize Silver Sponsors, Ozen Engineering, SEMI, and IEEE Santa Clara Valley Section. Bronze Sponsors, WMH Corporation, 3VR, and Lockheed Martin. Thank you. And of course, Education Award sponsors, IEEE Santa Clara Valley Section, IEEE Santa Clara Valley Section Chapter Electronics Packaging Society, IEEE SCV Section Chapter Consultants Network of Silicon Valley, Richard Elkis, Semi, Stan Myers, Ozen Engineering, Lockheed Martin, and 3VI. Thank you. And special recognitions and thank you to the City of Santa Clara and Congressman Ro Khanna for their proclamations. And thank you for equipment loans to ACM and the WRRF. Thank you. Oh. 
Okay, it is now time to present the Hall of Fame Committee. So I would like to introduce to you all Dr. Ajit Manocha, PhD. He is the C CEO of SIMI and prior Hall of Fame inductee. Dr. Ajit Manocha was Dr. Ajit Manocha was formerly CEO at Global Foundries, and while there, he served as the vice chairman and chairman of the Semiconductor Industry Association. Earlier, he served as EVP of Worldwide Operations at Spansion and as EVP and Chief Manufacturing Officer at Philips NXP Semiconductors. Manocha is active on global advocacy issues, championing electronics advances to improve global innovation, health, safety, talent, and education. He served on the President's Committees for Advanced Manufacturing Partnerships and the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. In 2020, the Silicon Valley Engineering Council introduced Minocha to be in the SVEC Hall of Fame for championing industry collaboration, driving manufacturing efficiency, and pioneering reactive ion etching as well as for many manufacturing process flows for logic and memory chips that serve as the foundation for modern electronics. Let's hear it for Dr. Minich. I would like to start by thanking the Silicon Valley Engineering Council for the invitation to speak and for their work on putting this fabulous event together. Please join me in giving them a big, big hand of applause, please. <laughs> Tonight, we gather to the induction banquet of the Silicon Valley Engineering Council Hall of Fame. This prestigious institution recognizes individuals whose visionary ideas, groundbreaking inventions, and tireless dedication have shaped the very fabric of our modern world. Silicon Valley, I'm sure you all know this, is the epicenter of technological advancement, and it has been the birthplace of countless trans transformative innovations that have revolutionized industries, economies, and societies worldwide. It has been at the forefront of technological progress for decades. The Silicon Valley Engineering Hall of Fame serves as a tribute to those who have propelled this region to global prominence while contributing to inventions that have reshaped our world. Looking back on my induction in 2020, when I reflect on joining the likes of Gordon Moore, Bob Noyes, David Packard, and so many other legends of Silicon Valley and the, and the semiconductor industry in this Hall of Fame, people who have inspired me and my career has really something that I'm very proud of, and I still get the chills. Actually, during my induction ceremony, my family was here with me, and I had uh, three grandkids in the ages of, at that time, six months or nine months to four or five years. And as I meant that this, the inductees that who have really done a wonderful job, but in my case, I don't know whether I deserve the same kind of recognition, but my grandchildren were inspired. My grandson, who's now nine years old, he still says, I want to be the best engineer in the world. My daughter, who was only two years old at that time, she's a fashion diva. She doesn't care. <laughs> so during my speech, she said, Granddad talks too much. <laughs> and she still reminds me of that. So today, I was hoping to bring them with me, but she said, no, I don't want to come. So, but uh, the point is that you do inspire people. And my grandson, who is really a uh, very smart, very genius kid, he, he, he has, his mind is made up. He wants to be an engineer. And plus there are many other stories in my family, but uh, I'll spare you for, for those stories today. But to this year's, Dr. Ranjan Nag, 
I welcome you on behalf of our fellow Hall of Famers. I hope you cherish tonight's recognition and joining this family of industry legends as much as I did for the last four years. But the significance of Silicon Valley Engineering Council Hall of Fame extends far beyond more rec mere recognition. It serves as a beacon of inspiration for inspiring engineers, scientists, and innovators around the world. By showcasing the remarkable achievements of his inductees, the Hall of Fame ignites a spark of creativity and ambition in the hearts of future generations, motivating them to push the boundaries of what is possible and strive for greatness. Moreover, the Silicon Valley Engineering Council Hall of Fame serves as a reminder of the collaborative nature of innovation behind, behind every breakthrough and every success story are countless individuals working tirelessly behind the scenes. And I'm saying this because I see there are a lot of students here. So I think this is really should be very inspiring for the students that one day you will be standing here and getting the in, in, inducted into Hall of Fame. So I think after I got inducted, it has made me even more accountable and responsible for what I need to do for the industry. And I'm working tirelessly to, to, to focus on the things that matters the most. For example, this industry, which is gonna double in size to one trillion from 600 billion last year. And we have the massive shortage of talent. There's a climate challenges. There's a supply chain disruptions and many others. These are global challenges and no single CEO, no single company, no single country can solve. So I think the future really is bright for the students who are here. There's a lot of issues. The climate issues are definitely the most important one, and of course, talent. So again, this forum will inspire many more people to really go and focus on the global challenges that we're all confronted with so that we can benefit from the growth of this industry to one trillion and that trillion industry is gonna bring a lot more benefits to the society. In fact, going forward, right now we're going through the AI era. And just wait another few years, the quantum era is gonna start. So IoT, AI, and quantum, that's gonna change the way we work, the way we think, the way we live. It's gonna to be totally different. And it's gonna happen in many of our lifetimes, especially mine for sure. So I think there's a lot, lot to happen. And this requires a lot of collaboration. And the collaboration requires that people like the, the, dif the different uh, from uh, sec sectors and so like this gathering get together and think about the future and inspire the young generations to get ready for next decade. So in closing, let us celebrate tonight's uh, Silicon Valley Engineering Council Hall of Fame induction banquet as a milestone in the history of technology and innovation. As we stand on the cusp of this new era of technological innovation, the Hall of Fame serves as a guiding light, reminding us the transformative power of human ingenuity and the endless possibilities that lie ahead of us. So in this, uh, with this say, I will say thank you very much for your support here, for the sponsors and the contributions of all. And let's make sure this institution continues to bring more uh, inductees into this and they will inspire the rest of the world and deal with the global challenges. Thank you very much. Okay, we got it working. So it is now my pleasure to invite to the stage Shri Celine, Vice President of the Silicon Valley Engineering Council to the stage. Shri has been an active SVEC officer and orchestrated the 2023 Open House. He chairs the Hall of Fame committee this year. Please give him a warm welcome to the stage. Thank you to the Silicon Valley Engineering Council for giving me this wonderful opportunity. It's a rare privilege and I am deeply honored to be here. And particularly in connection with the Hall of Fame, and we are here today to recognize and pay tribute to a very special person, specifically who has been the workforce, the workhorse, if you will, behind the tremendous Hall of Fame institution for over a decade, well over a decade. 
Thus, we have a special presentation for Stan Myers for his long-time efforts and support to the Hall of Fame. Stan, we would like to welcome you to the stage. <laughs> so, in, in a tribute from all of us, with sincere gratitude from your colleagues at the Silicon Valley Engineering Hall of Fame, the judges, committee members, board members, council members, and engineers, thank you for your years of leadership, guidance, judgment, and friendship. Your commitment and hard work and measured coaxing has greatly strengthened the Hall of Fame and helped to elevate the standing of our accomplished inductees that represent this premier engineering Hall of Fame in the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I also invite uh, Art Zafaripolo, Zafaripolo to say a few words because he has been a senior judge with our panel for many years. Thank you. I've been a member of the Silicon Valley panel of judges for the past several years, as it was said. I'm here to honor Stan Myers. He's been an icon in the semiconductor equipment and materials industry for more than 50 years. Stan began his career with Monsanto, and after 18 years in senior management positions, he joined Siltec Mitsubishi. He served as CEO when he was with Mitsubishi. During that time, Stan was on the board of directors of SEMI and International Trade Association for 24 years. 15 of those years, he was president and CEO. Stan has also served as chairman of the Silicon Valley Engineering Council for more than 10 years and will be retiring from that position. I'd like to thank Stan for all the work he's done within the organization and for all the hard work he's put in. And Stan is a very special colleague of mine for more than 40 years. Stan, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all of these guys very, very much. I've never done anything in this industry or in my family that hasn't been done by the family and by the industry. And I've only been very blessed with coming up with the end where most of us came out on a positive side. I was not going to make it tonight because I had a real problem about a week or so ago when I was at Stanford Hospital and my head was bleeding and a few things were happening. And that was a follow-up of some other problems I have at 87, 88 years old. But we're, we're conquering those. We're conquering many things. And certainly, uh, Artificial intelligence, have you guys ever heard of that? <laughs> it scares the hell out of me. Because if the wrong people get a hold of it, we're all in trouble. And if we don't learn politicians not to argue with each other and to work together, we are in trouble. And this world has some real things that it has to do. And technology can solve some of those problems if it's in the right hands and done the right way. Thank you very much. I did not, in fact, my wife decorated me up tonight uh, because I do have to go to the doctor for some things removed out of my head and that kind of thing. So I didn't expect this, but thank you very, very much for the notification. Way more than I do. This is, my, this is my little son. <laughs> he, he actually runs the, the CSA of Mountain View and has for 30, 40 years, and I'm very proud of him because of the people he helps in his organization. Stand is Semi's Energizer Bunny. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
our next uh, item here. It's uh, my distinct honor and privilege to present this year's uh, Hall of Fame inductee. The SVEC is glad to announce and add to the galaxy of exemplary Hall of Famers. The 2024 SVEC Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. Ranjan Nag. Say a few words. Okay, thank you. So his 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 work spans four plus decades across a multi-dimensional landscape, from developing state-of-the-art smart microphone comp componentry, the wizardry behind interpreting text, handwriting, and speech recognition, and digital distribution app. App Store platforms. His more recent focus on artificial intelligence for longevity and health sciences has been through the R42 Institute, where he is considered among the global pioneers of AI. Dr. Nag is chairman and founder of Bounce Imaging, developing unique throwable cameras that also won him the $1 million Verizon Powerful Answers Prize. His pioneering work extends to Ajemica, Vaccine for Aging, and superbio.ai, founded on the Life Science AI App Store, internationally known across Europe as the winner of the prestigious Mountbatten Medal in the UK, IET London. Dr. Ranjan Nog was also the recipient of the IEEE USA Outstanding Engineering Award in 2023. Early in the 90s, when I ran a small IR precision thermal lab serving the global semiconductor industry, it was my privilege to have met Dr. Nag many times at the Thai forums and with other Bay Area tech leaders and super achievers in the electronics field. Let's all meet him now. So without further ado, Dr. Nag. Okay. While they're getting the slides up. Anyway, we have some things to give Shree, you have some things to give him? <laughs> well, this is the Glass Special Award, uh, Dr. Ranjan Nag. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so. It's a great honor to receive this award. Uh, the Silicon Valley Engineering Council, I think it should uh, uh, remember, what, what does that stand for? It's a group of engineering institutions, uh, not least uh, certainly with the IEEE, uh, the ACM, the SME, SWE, and I think some others, the Electric Vehicle Auto Association. Um, many of us are members of those uh, association, but why are we members? Uh, we, we're members because we want to set standards, standards for ourselves. So, you know, I meet some young people and they say, I say, well, are you a member of the ACM? And he says, what's that? Right? Uh, uh, and it's very important at a very young age to be part of the professional body. You know, if you're a lawyer, you have a body there. If you're a Doctor, there's a body there. Uh, as engineers, we don't actually uh, need to be licensed in many activities to do engineering. In some, some areas you do. Uh, but uh, this is really one of the things where if you be part of a membership and it's not very expensive, of uh, the relevant organization, then you can actually um, increase standards, not just for yourself, but the other participants in the community. So thank you very much for this very gracious uh, award. And I, I think I feel like imposter syndrome at every level of my career. Uh, <laughs> a, a, and uh, this is certainly a pinnacle. I and mean, the other members have got this award. So well, what am I doing here, right? You know, it's sort of an interesting thing. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my career. And hopefully, uh, young or old, it'll give you some ideas and inspire you on what, what, what I'm doing. So uh, I'm pretty um, eclectic. You know, who am I? I've got really three personas, and, I, and really, I came to America, literally, me and my wife, we came to Sally Ann over there, we came here 35 years ago, 
uh, with, you know, the classic American dream was really not a penny in our pockets, really, and came here for academic reasons. Uh, and I've got three personas. One is uh, certainly I'd like to think of myself as, as an inventor, but I mean, I've invented it with my colleagues here. You know, many of them are in this room in different things. And the story looks quite nice, you know, but it, it, a lot of this happened through coincidence. So we started Lexicus, we sold that to Motorola, started Cellmania, which was doing App Store, sold that to BlackBerry. And then Vocal IQ is more the advisor, invested back to speech, we sold that to Apple. So there's the history of the mobile uh, universe. And now I'm working, moving to biology. Uh, second persona is I'm a investor. So I have a venture capital firm, R42, uh, which uh, invests in AI and longevity science companies. And the third persona is I'm a teacher. So I teach at Stanford University in the School of Medicine. I teach AI and uh, uh, longevity science. And I teach in two levels. One is a set of courses that anyone can take. And I see many of my students here. These are the continuing studies. So they're Stanford's cheapest courses. Uh, and uh, you know, hands up who's taken one of my courses. Who's taken one of my courses? There's quite a few. And then, uh, and then some people have taken uh, courses in the medical school as well. Uh, those are for the regular Stanford students, but very commonalities. But really, I've been working on uh, inventing things. I, I sometimes can't believe it. It's literally 40 years. Uh, my first... AI system was in actually uh, 1983 at Birmingham University. I've got my Birmingham University cufflinks here. Anyone from Birmingham University? Yeah, probably, probably not. Maybe one or, one or two. There, great. There, Janice. Excellent. I've <laughs> uh, got my little cufflinks here. And um, uh, did speech recognition uh, uh, there. And then uh, started looking at uh, handwriting recognition. And then started looking at, uh, did a lot of work in Chinese, actually. Uh, some of you worked on Chinese, I think, in, in that, that project uh, here. And then uh, uh, also, um, really the last 10 years, looking at the intersection of mathematics and medicine. Anybody who wants to learn from me, they can. I, we teach, I usually teach a course every quarter uh, at Stanford. And uh, right now I'm teaching a crash course in AI. I think some of you have taken that class. And sometimes I teach a longevity science class. But where did I get my inspiration from? Well, Star Trek, of course. <laughs> Star Trek. Now, the problem with Star Trek, is, well, it depends on the generation. Sometimes when I'm talking to high school students, I'm nattering on about Star Trek, and nearly half the things in Star Trek have been invented. One of the things that have not been invented is Android. The day. Then I suddenly realize they're thinking about the movie. If at all, I'm thinking about the TV series. Uh, 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 and, but really, that's why. And I sometimes think, well, oh, you mean you didn't watch Star Trek? Well, why are you an engineer then? That's the only reason I became an engineer. Invent cool stuff, right? And this is the first thing. You know, this is look at the look at the parameters of this processor. M sixty eight hundred Motorola processor, one megahertz, not gigahertz, a megahertz, a thousand times, eight kilobytes of RAM. Looking at connected, you know, doing telephone digit recognition. Uh, and the first project I was involved with was a company called Apricot. Not Apple, Apricot. Okay, <laughs> Apricot Computers, a uh, small British company, but actually invented the first laptop with speech recognition. At the time, we could only say 64 words at a time. Uh, started looking, thinking about speech, uh, when it came, came here to the States, came to St uh, Stanford, and started looking at, um, can we apply the same algorithms to handwriting recognition? And a lot of people could handle one character at a time, but very few people could handle the cursive problem, where you have joined up characters. And so we took some of these uh, speech recognition algorithms, applied them to the handwriting problem, and we actually, actually made, made a product. Uh, and it's at Stanford, we had a, um, a prototype. And uh, my reputation is, you know, uh, is coming from Stanford and getting on the cover of Fortune magazine in the shortest amount of time. Uh, and this title, Computers That Mimic the Brain, this, this article is not 30 days old, it's 30 years old. <laughs> and, and we're still talking about it. <laughs> and my prediction is we're going to be talking about it 30 years from now. Uh, did a lot of work, lot, lot of work in Chinese, uh, Chinese handwriting recognition. Um, trying to take English. Ha Chinese, those of you who don't know, has got you know, as many as 20,000 characters, very difficult problem. Uh, Motorola, they, said they bought our company and they said, um, we need you to invent Chinese handwriting. We've just invented texting and we don't know how to get the characters in the box. 
And I said, I don't speak, read, or write Chinese. And they said, we don't care. You've got to invent it. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we had a, had a project. We had a team there. And that, that was fun. And then uh, towards Motorola, we, we made phones that um, had browser, full screen, uh, um, uh, handsets, and games, and apps. And so I started, left Motorola to start Cellmania, which uh, did really the first mobile app store. We were crowdsourcing intelligence. Instead of building each feature ourselves, we had uh, really put a million people into, into jobs, into engineering jobs, uh, to actually create the features across the world. And Research in Motion bought that company. Uh, next thing was uh, looking at Vocal IQ. Uh, I was more the investor, the advisor in that. And that was trying to do dialogue processing, uh, saying, how can you actually uh, uh, interact with your phone on a multi-state basis? But what is intelligence? Intelligence is reasoning, thinking, knowledge, uh, perception, problem solving. And uh, most of what we see in AI is not that. You know, they're sort of fingerprint recognizers, uh, loan predictors. You can't adapt to one thing. And we're seeing with GPT now language, but it's not, not uh, um, the full solution. It's still you know, pretty quickly now people say, well, I know that's GPT. I know a machine created it. And so we're at peak generative AI uh, right now. And the question is, is it going to follow a trough of disillusionment? Or is it going to be, have we actually gone through the cycle already and we actually be more productive? Uh, and can it actually be creative? The historic uh, critique of AI is that, oh, it'll never be like humans. It can never be creative. So we're safe. Um, Robbie, one of my students, trained a system on 14,000 landscape paintings. And this is a, uh, a painting that was created by that system. And... Uh, 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 he saw, I thought he was being clever. He sold it for $2,000 to uh, Business Week uh, to go on the cover. Uh, but then uh, a French company took his code and uh, ran it and then created a painting and sold it for $425,000 at Christie's. Uh, and he thought, well, uh, you know, there's a lot, little bit of discussion. Well, who owned the painting? Was it the code? Was it Robbie? Was it the French company? And actually, there was more critique from the computer science, from the engineering community, than there was from the art community, who seemed to be a bit confused about what, what was going on here. Uh, uh, computer science, well, why can't you just print another one out? What's, so, what, what's, this, what's the special? Uh, so, of course, we've got bigger computers, uh, more parameters than ever, and as we can get to even more parameters, we can do more things. And this is where you know, we are at an inflection point, and I think many computer scientists have been... Uh, phased uh, about this, but many are saying, uh, well, look, it's not, still not humanity. It's not human. We've not got to what's called artificial generalized intelligence, where it's human-like performance. Some people say, actually, yes, it is there. We're already there, and we keep moving the goalposts. Now, what used to be the Turing test, can you tell it's a human or not? That's not good enough anymore. Now it's got to show empathy. Oh, now it's got to show guilt. Now it's got to show envy. You keep moving the goalposts. When, when, at what point are we going to say that it's real? So that's what I've been working on before for like 30 years. The last 10 years, what I've been working on now, um, really I've, I've got three vehicles. You know, I teach at Stanford, but I also have a venture fund that works on invests in uh, deep science companies. And um, the key area I'm looking at is right now is AI and longevity science. So AI, as we all know, we talked about it's going at exponential levels, but biology is also improved at exponential levels. And we've got a number of techniques that just didn't exist uh, even as little as 10 years ago. Uh, lots of papers on our website that you can look at and read about. All our students have written, some of you have written these. Uh, the, the, the company I'm working on right now is, is Agemica, which is a vaccine for aging trying to double lifespan. Lifespan right now, the average age of death is 78. Uh, actually, it's dropped to 76 in, in the United States. Uh, things in biology seem to terminate right at 115, 116. Uh, the oldest person, this is Jean Comment, lived to 122. Uh, she started smoking at 112. <laughs> uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, but she's quite social, and a lot, lot of free time. I think she, she, she had a fairly relaxed life. Uh, but what's going to happen in the next 20 years, and you're seeing this in Japan already, where it used to be lots and lots of 
young people and a very few old people, number, number, uh, uh, it's going to be more different. It's going to be healthy people in their 70s and 80s, 90s, and if I have it my way, 110s, 120s, uh, where we're just going to be a much, much different society. I can think about what that will mean, the people who want to work when they're 80. And what is ageing? Ageing is wisdom. It's not all bad, you no. Know, so it's back pain, degeneration, but also humour. You know, we don't get quite bothered. We don't have, like, dollar solutions to nickel problems. You know, we don't fly off the handle. I'm not sure if you've noticed that with older people. They're, they're a bit, bit calmer. They're, they're, they're more... Uh, 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 calm in their decision making and the key question is is aging a single characteristic or is it right now we're treating aging as multiple diseases and we treat disease one at a time and there's a search right now to say can we solve all those things all at once and uh, I want to use AI for that and there's actually a prize for it, anyone who can solve this problem can win $101 million, the next prize for this uh, solution. Uh, and the prize is, can you add uh, uh, 20 years in, in a treatment period of one year to a person? So there's a lot. Animals younger, can we make people younger? And uh, uh, and I'm using a number of techniques. I'm using certainly a Jemica. Another one is certainly Superbioda AI, which is a, uh, uh, the world's largest AI library for biology. Right now, we're commoditizing uh, engineering. The most popular programming language today is English. So I can do that, right? We can go to ChatGPT and start typing stuff in. Uh, that's going to come, basically, we can be generate millions of engineers uh, in the world that, that didn't, that didn't uh, uh, exist. I think the IE, IEEE has got um, 400,000, 500,000 members. The IET has got 200,000 members. We'll probably get millions, millions of members, people who are interested in this. Uh, and we apply it to different things. Other things I'm interested in, uh, ECRIO, I'm the chairman of ECRIO, looking at AI in 5G networks. Uh, this is bounce imaging, uh, which is uh, a throwable camera. Uh, this is the one, no, I didn't get the Nobel Prize. I haven't got the Nobel Prize yet, but it's, uh, I did get the Verizon Prize. I'm not sure if anyone's from Verizon here, which is a million dollars. It's more expensive than the Nobel Prize. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's basically a camera. It's got six cameras around the ball, and you throw it, and as it whizzes round, it takes a live 360-degree stitched video image. And it's for first responders, so see what's going on and what's happening. So it's doing really, really well, selling, uh, selling like hotcakes. Uh, but I'm really interested in cool stuff. Uh, I know we've got uh, uh, India Techs here, I think. Um, they, they were showing an exhibit. This is a, a pill that you can swallow and you can drive it like a drone in your stomach. <laughs> right, it's absolutely amazing. Tori and uh, Quentin's over here. There we go, they've, they've got it over there, showing it over there. Uh, so I'll stop there because they only gave me 20 minutes. Uh, if you want to talk to me more, uh, you can actually talk to my avatar. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I'm an AI person, you can talk to my avatar. And actually, it's actually cleverer than me. Uh, so uh, you can talk to my avatar and uh, and ask me questions, and it's actually 95, 90, this is a super.ai, I think they're floating around here, uh, about 90, 95, 98% of the time, it's what I would have said. It's actually what I would have said. So this would have been, uh, this would be quite interesting for you. So I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there, I think that's my last slide. That's, uh, I think I've, I'm on time, I think, is that, is that right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I don't, is that... Uh, do we have time for a, a question, or uh, do we go straight to Val? Okay, a question or a comment. Anyone got a question or a comment? And, wants to... and there might be questions online as well. No questions online. Who's got a question or comment? Which one's more accurate, you or the avatar? Uh, oh, I think, like I said, I think the avatar's cleverer than me. Okay, Daryl. How can we invest? <laughs> Which one of these things? <laughs> there we go. Supra's over there. And then I think Tori's over there. Uh, we can invest in them. 
Uh, and um, yeah, Chris, he'll take he'll take checks at the end of the meeting. Uh, R forty two will take checks too. Uh, any other any other uh, yes. Yeah, can the Earth sustain the population and what's going to happen? I'm an optimist. I'm a, I've actually become American since I arrived here, so I'm a glass-half-full guy, uh, as opposed to being British, who's a glass-half-empty guy. Uh, and I think technology, we've been saying that the Earth can't do this, can't do that for decades. The Club of Rome in the 1960s said we'd have a disaster in 1980. We didn't have one because it didn't include technology as the solution for many of our problems. So I think technology can solve many of our problems, but it's not going to be easy. And we've got to have vision. We've got to, you know, we talked about the climate change. We've got to set it out there. And how, and how do we do it? How do we double lifespan to 150? How do we reduce the temperature of the earth by two degrees or stop it increasing by two degrees? Um, you've got to set those goals and then go towards them. We're on time, right? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the email.
flight school and uh, got my pilot license, uh, helicopter license first, and then airplane, fixed wing, and so this was the really, still is a big passion of mine. And when I sold my previous company, which became the uh, world's largest, um, actually, network of smart charging stations, the idea was we get all these batteries on wheels that we can connect to the grid, we can use all the battery capacity to balance the renewable uh, power production so that we can produce more and more and eventually 100% renewable grid balanced by 100% um, electric cars. So that was a great vision. We built the network, the company was sold, but um, as I was thinking about the next thing to do, the clear focus was going to be aviation. Um, That's my personal passion and really one of the biggest problems that we have. So, um, Today, aviation is uh, anywhere between two and a half and three percent of the total human uh, carbon emissions, but the actual impact is actually quite a bit higher than that. So already, um, we have about uh, five to ten percent of total human climate impact caused by aviation, and the reason for that is aviation or aircraft um, is quite unique uh, compared to all other types of transportation the majority of emissions occur at altitude. And if you look at all the um, products of combustion at altitude, the impact is much different from the same products at ground level. So if you have trucks and cars emitting NOx emissions or particulate emissions or high temperature water vapor that comes out of all those combustion engines at the grounds, they have relatively, relatively little effect. NOx has health effects, but not so much climate effects. When you emit them at 30, 40,000 feet in altitude, profound effects. So actually, 3x, 2 to 3x of uh, carbon effect is from those non-carbon sources. Uh, which means that if we just project the trajectory all the way forward to, let's say, 2050, when everybody wants to be net zero, uh, all the countries, many companies have pledges, um, you can get into a situation when aviation is 25 to 50% of all climate impact uh, that humanity causes. And this clearly is not a situation that anybody wants, uh, nor will be allowed to have. Right? So this industry really has an existential problem. If we don't solve this problem, then nobody will be able to fly right, come 30 years from now. So we really need to solve it. This solution, we think, is the hydrogen electric aviation. So remember my previous company was all about battery electric cars. I'm a big fan of battery electrics, uh, but um, I'm also a physicist. And when we started uh, thinking about um, how we're going to solve aviation problem and we've done a lot of um, analysis of the fundamentals of the batteries, you know, we look at the um, you know, iron carriers, lightest metal, lithium, and if you just take that, and if you calculate what kind of charge density you can have without any of the electrolytes, anode, cathodes, you get into limitations. And those limitations tell you that you're not going to have a large aircraft, 300 person aircraft, similar to uh, today's uh, 787 Airbus 350, you're not going to have that aircraft going 6,000 miles on batteries. Right? That's just not going to happen. There's not fundamental, and not because batteries today are bad batteries and they will become better, but it's just not going to be possible from the physics. Unless we change the, invent a new type of, completely new type of battery, and by new type I mean Today, all the batteries are basically ion carriers, and um, you know, we need to figure out some other way. Yeah? So we said, okay, we can't wait for that. Um, actually, before uh, all this um, uh, business uh, background, I was a PhD uh, uh, student um, at uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator, worked at Stanford Linear Accelerator, and um, in the uh, high energy field. So that was one of the, I was joking with my friends, that this is one of the areas where you're for sure not going to see the impact of your work anywhere in real life for 50 years, probably for your lifetime, right? So this is very, uh, very long term. So we don't have that time. So what can we do that's shorter than that and that can bring us uh, in this industry closer to uh, zero impact? So that's electrification, but with the right energy carrier. And the right energy carrier we thought is hydrogen, uh, which is the uh, uh, most uh, energy dense by unit of weight, uh, or high specific energy of all chemical substances out there. 
uh, we just need to convert it to electricity. So we use fuel cells. That way we avoid all the product, products of combustion and we actually have higher efficiency than any combustion engine today. Right? So fuel cells already operate at 60% plus uh, efficiency levels, so it's much, much higher than the jet engines of today, even the largest ones. All the other solutions have efficiency, so really this is the best way to do it. Also, um, and that was similar to um, our story with my previous company, Electric Motor Works, where we said, hey, we, we can actually make these great services save people money. So we're not only green, and we're not only uh, saving the environment and bringing more renewables to the market, we can actually make transportation cheaper, we can make uh, the charging uh, cheaper. Uh, that was a big part of the story. Same way, the big part of the story at Zero Avia is reducing the cost of travel. Because if you look at the economics of renewable energy, um, renewable electricity production, couple that with electrolysis, um, you get much better economics than fossil fuels even today. And if you look at the future, then in the future you're going to have obviously you know, policies around fossil fuels, you're going to have um, a higher cost of extraction, and the economics will be even better. Right? So we, we save on fuel, we save on maintenance costs, uh, so this is really the best way uh, to do things in aviation. So how do we set it up um, after we figured out um, the area, the hydrogen electric area? So we built the team and technology uh, around uh, three main areas, power generation systems. So we have our own fuel cells that we built. The company is now about uh, a little over 200 engineers um, in the UK and the US. Um, they started in a, a place called Closer uh, here just uh, 40 miles south, uh, in the middle of uh, um, the fields, uh, so easier, easy to uh, fly test articles and test various things with uh, dangerous spinning objects. Um, and then uh, we created our own fuel cells, uh, we built our own power electronics, and we are building our own um, electric motors as well. This is the only way, uh, we believe, to create a product that's really competitive in the market, because we're taking on the majors like Rolls-Royce, uh, General Electric, Safran, Kraft Newton, uh, the big four. Um, and you really need to have control over the entire technology space. So this is the first product uh, that we're bringing to market. Um, the company's been around for about six years. Uh, we're now officially in the uh, certification program uh, with the uh, Federal Aviation um, Authority here, administration, and uh, Civil Aviation Authority in, uh, in the UK. Uh, so two global uh, regulators. Um, this is uh, uh, the engine that we're building. Uh, we have already flown a number of test aircraft. I'll show you some of those. Uh, uh, and it's already starting to work on the uh, next uh, generation engine that will go into the even larger aircraft. This one is can power uh, up to about 50 seat uh, aircraft in a traditional uh, type of vehicles, uh, 10 to 20 seats. Uh, so I see 9 to 19 seats here. If you take aircraft of today and uh, put this engine into those, um, then this would be up to 20 seats. But there are uh, possible airframes that you can build with this engine that will go up to 50. Uh, a larger engine, uh, called 2000 for 2 megawatt plus, um, this can go into up to 100 seat aircraft. And we're already um, looking at some regional jet applications there as well. It can scale up to 4 megawatts and maybe even higher. Um, overall roadmap uh, goes all the way to um, the large aircraft, um, single aisle. We already have uh, some discussions with uh, some folks about the applications um, in the uh, aircraft of the size of the 737, um, Airbus A320, and similar sizes. So you really can electrify those vehicles, uh, but you really need a better uh, energy carrier. So we have uh, flown already uh, several prototypes. Uh, the first prototype actually was even before this one um, in 2019. Uh, we flown our first um, battery electric aircraft. This uh, at the time was the world's largest uh, zero emission aircraft, a six seat aircraft, same airframe as this one. Um, but uh, we flew it out of Hollister. I was uh, our first uh, test pilot. 
um, which I'm not allowed to do anymore. Um, but uh, that, was, that was a memorable day. I just grabbed my uh, chief engineer and uh, asked him if, he, if we were ready, and he said we're ready. So we went uh, uh, went for a flight. Uh, it was it was a short flight, but um, very memorable. Uh, the company was just uh, six or seven uh, people uh, at the time, so we got to the first uh, first flying vehicles. Uh, this is the second prototype. Um, I, once we flown uh, the first one, and uh, this became public, um, we got a lot of attention worldwide, as you can imagine. Um, the UK, uh, specifically, uh, was very interested in hosting at least part of our R&D, so they gave us uh, a small uh, initial grant that brought us to the UK. And that actually uh, have been used many, many times by the UK government over the last uh, few years as the uh, testament um, uh, to uh, their forward-looking vision uh, in aviation because now the company is, uh, has 200 people in the UK from zero in just uh, four, four or five years, yeah, about four years. Um, so we cloned this one. Um, this became the world's largest hydrogen electric aircraft. Uh, then uh, we uh, set up um, the project to fly the full-size vehicle, full-size engine, and uh, last year uh, we flew this 20-seat aircraft uh, in the UK in January um, and started scaling from there as well. So these engines are now in certification. Uh, this is our next uh, prototype that we started to work on uh, last year together with Alaska and Canada and Canada. This is an 80-seat aircraft in active service uh, worldwide in various places. Uh, this is in our uh, Everett uh, location, so Seattle area. Um, and we already demonstrated uh, some of the technology, not on flight but on the ground, uh, at two megawatt level that would be required to uh, bring something like this uh, up in the air per side. Right? So the total uh, power of the aircraft level is over five megawatt. Uh, that's what we're looking at there. Uh, we're also working on the uh, uh, fuel side of things um, uh, with partners. Uh, so all the power plant technologies are in-house. But on the fuel side of things, uh, for fuel generation, we work with other partners on the electrolysis side. But we do build um, the platform for, uh, back to uh, my previous company origins, uh, about the platform about smart hydrogen production, balancing of the renewable grid, renewable production of electricity on the grid so that we can, uh, again, increase the amount of renewable power on the grid and use it to produce this fuel and then use the fuel in this hard to evade sectors like aviation. And we have partnerships now with uh, 15 or to 20 airports uh, worldwide uh, with a vision that all the fuel uh, for aviation in the future will be moving to hydrogen as, uh, as a carrier. And by the way, um, you know, another you might have seen on the previous slides, um, one of the other ways to repower aircraft is use uh, what's called SAS, sustainable aviation fuels, liquid fuels, drop-in replacement. We think it's a, maybe a solution, interim solution like plug-in hybrids for cars, for example, but in aviation everything takes longer, so maybe instead of uh, you know, five, seven, ten years in, in car space, maybe 20, 30 years. Uh, but for that, you also need hydrogen to produce sustainable aviation fuel. So you need hydrogen, no matter what you do, how you replace, uh, the fossil fuels in aviation, you will need hydrogen. Um, so we've been uh, very fortunate to work with the uh, top uh, partners out there. So from the very beginning, uh, we're supported by great investors. Uh, so Bill Gates through uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, um, Amazon Climate Pledge Funds, um, uh, a number of other uh, high-profile investors joining the team um, and uh, joined our partner base. Uh, we have five uh, major airlines, um, uh, you see some names here, American, United, Alaska, uh, all customers and um, also investors. Uh, in our latest round, Airbus uh, came in as a lead investor as well, uh, together with the Barclays, a major bank, um, and Neon, which is, uh, maybe some of you know the project in Saudi Arabia, the uh, mega zero emission mega city that uh, the Saudis are building, a trillion dollar project, uh, so we're hoping that we can get some of that trillion dollars and actually use it um, uh, in practical uh, projects for aviation. Um, great number of other partners uh, sold, uh, already pre-sold over 2,000 engines on pre-order, uh, so $10 billion or so worth of uh, future revenues. 
um, and uh, looking to uh, decarbonize aviation uh, and not only decarbonize but also remove all climate impact um, from the aviation market. Um, so thank you for inviting me here and uh, hopefully uh, uh, this makes sense to all of you and uh, I'm here for a question. Uh, what's the purity requirement for the hydrogen that goes into fuel cells? Um, so 
For the first product, uh, the requirement is the same as uh, for the uh, ground transportation. Um, so all the hydrogen cars uh, that we have, uh, about 100,000, I think, worldwide. Um, same requirement there. Uh, for the next generation of fuel cells, the high temperature fuel cells, they utilize um, a, a different, um, uh, different membrane, uh, different electrolytes, uh, so they're actually more tolerant to impurities. So you can have um, up to um, oh, the purity down to 99% instead of the, the, the five nines that you require for the, for the cars. But already, even for the five nines, you already have the source um, in the video. The industry knows how to make it, it's just more expensive. Right? As we go to the next generation of fuel cells, you can relax it even more. In terms of applications, the advantages of hydrogen fuel cell engines for the application of drones, where do you see the benefits? Yeah, we actually have several. Uh, so the question is applications for drones, VTOLs, and, and other. Um, Aircraft. So we think that uh, all aviation will, over time, will move to hydrogen propulsion, just because the fundamentals of the uh, energy, specific energy, right? So we were talking at the table there, energy density versus specific energy. Uh, so obviously hydrogen takes a lot of volume, right? But for aircraft, uh, generally speaking, mass is much more important than volume, because you have to carry, you have to generate lift. It's a, um, it's a very expensive uh, uh, metric. Uh, to carry. Um, so the volume you can solve for, the mass you can, so hydrogen is the best of mass. So that's why we think over time, the entirety of aviation moves to hydrogen. We already have some customers in the uh, VTOL space, uh, so one that's publicly uh, announced is uh, the company, 60 year old uh, uh, rotor craft company called Biosafe Corporation. They've done a lot of designs uh, that are built now by Boeing and Sikorsky and uh, various other companies. And um, we are building the world's first hydrogen uh, helicopter with them. Actually, that's supported by the uh, uh, U.S. Air Force uh, uh, grants uh, project right now. Um, and you can show that um, the physics and the economics of uh, hydrogen electric in VTOL in the rotorcraft is also better than the existing incumbents. Um, so really, across the entire aviation, we'll see this. Last one? Okay. Yeah, last okay, one. Okay, You mentioned about uh, you know, because of you, uh, multiple systems and more reliable, how does it compare to the combustion engine space? Um, how many types of uh, reliability? Okay, so the question is uh, what's the numerical um, uh, improvement in the reliability compared to combustion engines? Uh, well, so um, how to answer this? Uh, once you have a redundancy, you, you're actually, it's, it's quite non-linear that you have improvements in reliability, right? So for example, why do we have in the existing aircraft, why do we have uh, in most commercial aircraft two engines, right? Because you cannot achieve the required level of reliability with just one engine. Yeah, and that's why in Europe, uh, you know, they don't allow uh, passenger operations with a single engine aircraft. Um, so you, you, you actually can achieve um, uh, significantly higher by orders of magnitude better uh, for a single propulsor aircraft, uh, order, several orders of magnitude better reliability than for a combustion engine. Combustion engine, single engine, uh, any part fails, you're done, right? You, you have complete loss of power and uh, then you will land, all right? So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's not, not, not an option. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with a more redundant system and uh, most of the electrical systems, Design them correctly, uh, the penalty for redundancy is very, very low. Um, so that's, that's a really structural benefit here. Uh, it's very easy to have uh, multiple electrical machines, multiple electrical uh, paths, uh, power generation and processing in, in a small aircraft. So basically, like you can have an R2 in the, you know, the, uh, the two redundancy, three redundancy. Yeah, so in, in, in the smallest engine that we have, we have four quad, quad redundancy effectively, right? Now, we, we can lose two and still maintain level flight, right? Um, so two out of four, and that's, that's a very, very rare event um, when you have, you know, two, two failures out of four. Okay, thank you very much.
So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Janneke Schneider to introduce the recipients of the 2024 SBEC Education Awards. So, Dr. Schneider is the member delegate for the Society of Plastic Engineers, SPE Golden Gate section, and president of that section. Dr. Schneider has been on the SBEC board for two years, has been education committee chair both years. So, please welcome her to the stage to give out the SBEC Education Awards. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and this is my favorite part of the show. <laughs> and I might be a little bit biased as an educator, but I think it's really important to honor um, outstanding students and, and educators. Um, and so without any further ado, I would like to announce our education awards. Now, I want to mention There we go. Okay, so this year we had a lot of applicants, 35 applicants, and we couldn't really make these decisions without our esteemed judges, so I really appreciate the help of Allison Wright, Maggie Best, Helen Arrington, Glenn Friedman, Shree Salen, and Craig, and Sue Craig. Um, and if you're ever interested in being a judge, please talk to me. We really need judges <laughs> for these awards. Okay, so um, I'm going to announce our winners, and I'd like you to come join me on the stage when your name is called. <coughs> so our first winner is Priyanka Karana Karan, and she is a senior at the Evergreen Valley High School. Priyanka, please come. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, Priyanka is going to be attending MIT uh, in the next fall. She is going to be majoring in both computer science and business and minoring in public policy. She is the founder and co-captain of the robotics team. And also she's very involved with Society of Women Engineers. Our committee was very impressed with Priyanka's leadership skills and her fascinations with programming and AI. Priyanka hopes to make technology more accessible to underrepresented groups by empowering others to reach their potential. Congratulations, Priyanka. Okay, our next winner is Vivian Yang. And I do want to mention that all of our winners today are women, but we have a lot of male applicants. There's no discrimination at all, I promise. We, half of our judges are men, so please, don't think of that. It's just we had so many amazing applicants. So Vivian, please come along. Vivian is a senior at the Castro Valley High School. She's also involved with um, Society of Women Engineers. She's the vice president of her chapter. Um, and she's also president and co-founder of the Radiant Readers Club, which provides literary support to local elementary schools. Vivian is passionate about research and science, and she's done internships at both Berkeley's lab and at the Oakland Zoo. She plans to study mechanical engineering and also business administration. You're kind of getting a theme here, business and, and, and science. Um, and she hopes to be a founder and a CEO. Congratulations. Our next person, our next winner is Niksha Sharma. She's actually a junior. She's the only junior that won the scholarship. And um, thank you, Niksha. Um, so Niksha fascinated the committee with her various leadership roles, including um, being a global lead for the Youth Parliament, which is a UN Science Summit Committee and organizes students to speak on specific issues. She is also the founder and CEO of the Youth Mentorship Program, which provides mentorship to STEM projects. In her spare time, she has not enough, she works as a computational neuroscience researcher at Stanford's um, Schnitzer Lab. She's using AI to analyze dendritic spine images. And after college, she wants to work at a 
company that focuses on research doing, um, you know, something like open AI, Boston Dynamics. I think you should talk to Ron John. <laughs> Great person to talk to about AI. Thank you so much. Okay. And, and our last high school winner, um, she is not able to be here because she is really involved with the robotics team and she has a big day today. But I still want to honor her. Amanda Zang from Mountain View High School. She also, so she's the, the lead on the software team and they have a big meeting today. So she's really sad she couldn't be here. Maybe she's streaming this. Um, so she's also done research at the Berkeley Hybrid um, Research Robotics Lab. And she created her own career panel on AI. So we were really impressed by her leadership skills and dedication to science. And Amanda wants to work at NASA. She wants to explore new worlds and assist astronauts across the universe. Congratulations, Amanda. Okay. We do have a few honorable yes. mentions. Yes. Totally um, so our honorable mentions, they are all men, but they did really great. We want to honor them. Michael Leong, Ethan Ransing, and Oliver Chang. Congratulations. Awards. Um, so our first winner is Claire Hung. Come up here, Claire. So Claire is studying computer science and physics at Berkeley. She's a junior there, and she is a researcher in the in Laura Waller's computer imaging lab. She's also very involved in the Society of Women Engineers, where she's the president of outreach, and she oversees a, a variety of programs for K through 12 students, including a 10-week research program for female high school engineers and a one-day STEM program for 80 local underserved students. Claire also did an internship at Apple where she developed an automated testing framework for a camera simulator. And she hopes to get her PhD where she will explore the joint design of optics and algorithms. Again, maybe you should talk to your mom, John, um, for imaging. So, congratulations. Winner is Tram Du. Please come come here, Tram. So Tram is a senior at San Jose State, and she is majoring in aviation, flight operations, and, and also minoring in business. She will be graduating this spring. She has worked as an analyst assistant for the aviation safety reporting system, uh, managed by NASA. She's also the vice president of the president of women in aviation at the San Jose State chapter. She is also involved in outreach programs at, through the San Jose College Corps, um, and which is an after-school program for fifth graders. So Tram wants to be a pilot, definitely talk to our other speaker, um, and she's dedicated to supporting women in aviation, inspiring younger and our generation of enthusiasts. So. Very happy. So we're right. and, and our final winner, she couldn't be here today, is another San Jose State student, Dima Sadek. Um, so she is studying industrial and systems engineering and minoring in computer science. She's also a junior. Um, she is the publication director of her I tri triple I SE club, and she also tutors. Um, elementary and college students. She hopes to develop a medical um, a history passport, so like a, just like a passport, but has all your medical history. Um, and she really thinks that modern problems can be solved with the right program or invention. So I'd like to congratulate. And, um, and uh, we do have one honorable mention, also from San Jose State, um, and that is Maria Fernanda Palacios Martinez. So, <laughs> and just so you know, our our high school winners get five hundred dollars. Our college winners get a thousand dollars. That's our scholarship. All right. Thank you so much for all the twenty twenty four recipients. And I'm going to end tonight by congratulating our Keeper of the Flame recipient, and that is Deborah Dimas.
from Santa Teresa High School. So Deborah, you're very welcome. Um, so, in addition to teaching physics, Deborah mentored the first program, the robotics competition, along with a couple other clubs. Let me move on. Here we go. So, she teaches a bunch of physics classes, and then she um, mentors the Interact Club and the Physics Club. And two years ago, she did this whole um, redesign of her curriculum that's based on grading equity. So really not focusing on the volume of information, but making sure students really understand what they're meant to do. She's also part of this Ignite program that, that guides fellow teachers in incorporating their, their summer um, learnings or internships into their curriculum. She also teaches, she leads a, a physics district group, providing support to her fellow faculty. And really what caught our committee's attention that despite 34 years, she's always willing to learn new things. So she told us about, um, uh, four years ago, she was taught, told by another teacher about the robotics curriculum. And she thought it was really interesting. And she, um, so this, this curriculum includes coding and circuits and all these things that students do at their own pace. And although it is a challenging curriculum, students learn a lot better. And so the fact that you can still innovate after 34 years and find new things for fellow faculty is really impressive. So we really commend Deborah for her, her dedication to science and fellow teachers. And I think she's an inspiration for us all and highlights the values of this council. Congratulations. get one more round of applause first for our Education Award recipients. <laughs> for this year's inspiring Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. Nog. <laughs> and let's get a thank you for our keynote speaker, Valma Chabal.